All right, well, happy Pandemic Monday, everybody. Uh, I'm Kathy Bloom, I'm the Communications Director for Hetty Vermont, and we decide, we've been trying to think about um, ways we can help the community both prepare, respond, and manage this ongoing, extremely unusual situation. Because even if you're a fan of shows like Walking Dead, or if you've been a climate activist thinking about these issues in the long term, uh, this stuff is really hard for everybody when the when the poo hits the fan, as it were. And a big piece of the puzzle is how people can manage their emotional response in a crisis, both in the short term and over the long term. Fortunately, I happen to be married to Mark Nash, who is, among other things, a licensed mental health counselor, psychotherapist, and he is he's been thinking a lot about this stuff, not just from a professional standpoint, from a personal and psycho-spiritual standpoint. And so we thought it would be great to do Mental Health Mondays here uh, and bring in one of the pros who I happen to be hiding out with um, so we don't have to worry about that piece of the puzzle. Um, so Mark, welcome to what I think is probably going to be an ongoing conversation. And please, if you guys have questions, feel free. Um, and I thought we would just start out if you wanted to talk about, in fact, your own personal response to all of this, because you tend to be a fairly steady individual, but this is bigger than anything anyone else has experienced and how you're handling it personally. It's hard. Um, part of the job of being a psychotherapist is being incredibly sensitive to the emotional energy in the room. Uh, and in this case, the emotional energy um, is global and uh, I experience it. Um, there's my own anxiety around changes in work patterns, changes in income, um, what it means to socially isolate, uh, but there's also the constant stream of information um, either in terms of just pure news about what's happening but also about all of the people that are uh, experiencing a lot of challenges and so I tend to take that on and uh, I have to do a certain amount of self-care to make sure that I don't get overwhelmed. Yeah, everybody I'm sure has to do that kind of self-care. So I think one of the biggest most immediate responses to all of this is anxiety mm -hmm. because humans like certainty mm -hmm. and this is a situation of vast uncertainty mm -hmm. and so uh, can you actually explain what anxiety is technically? What happens in a human being when they get anxious? Uh, anxiety is the fancy word for fear. We get scared. Um, we are always on the lookout for threats in our environment. And when a real threat shows up, a physical threat, our body responds with a surge of adrenaline, moves us into fight or flight um, to keep ourselves safe. Unfortunately, our bodies can't distinguish between an emotional threat or an imagined threat and an actual physical threat. So as we sit here contemplating what is happening and what might be happening in the future, our bodies tend to uh, create that adrenaline and we feel scared anxious, worried, um, physically it's often a knot in the stomach or a tightness in the chest, um, uh, difficulty breathing sometimes, increased heart rate in the case of a panic attack that's ex essentially extreme anxiety and um, so we have physiological responses to um, what our mind is experiencing. I think there's also a piece of the puzzle where <clears throat> there's people concerned about income my job shut down or your job shut down or you know your contracts have dried up and that's all very real there's also this sense of this invisible threat mm -hmm. of a virus that we can't see that has a lag time between exposure and uh, symptoms yep. and that sense of nobody knowing exactly what their own personal response to the virus is going to be so there's the tangible stuff that's immediately happening and then there's a sort of larger invisible threat. But it sounds to me like what you're saying is the body doesn't distinguish between those kinds of threats. Uh, not at all. Anytime we have a sense that there is something uh, threatening and, and just the unknown 
feels threatening to us. As you said at the beginning, we like certainty and we like predictability. And without that, um, our body moves to this place of, I've got to protect myself. From what? We can't even say sometimes. Right. And I can imagine washing hands could become more than like a ritual. It could almost become like an obsession because it's the one thing we've been told. Isolate and wash your hands. And so yeah. I can imagine we turn to those things almost from a talismanic perspective. If I do this enough, maybe I'll be okay. Yeah. Um, and that can be useful or not useful depending on how... Um, emotionally committed we get to the process. <laughs> exactly. So, so when, what do we do in those sort of regular moments of, you know, I've just read something or I've just contemplated my own circumstances and you get that ice water in your veins feeling, what do you do in those moments? Uh, you breathe. I mean, it, uh, probably everybody has heard that connecting to your breath is the best way to manage emotional distress. Uh, it's almost cliche at this point, but there's actually some really good underlying reasons why that is the go-to. Uh, one is a deep, slow breath physiologically calms the autonomic nervous system. And so a few of those actually changes our biochemistry. It's also the case that the anxiety is provoked by, as you suggested, perhaps information that we've received. And our mind goes into uh, a what if uh, scenario sometimes, or goes into um, just feeling a deep amount of empathy for those who we are, uh, th that we know are suffering. And the more our mind stays in those uncomfortable places, the more our body responds. And so by focusing on the breath, it's really hard for the brain to think of two things at exactly the same time. And so the breath becomes a point of focus that moves us away from that thing that might be bothering us. Um, this is also you know, known as staying in the present. And the breath is a great anchor for staying in the present so that our mind doesn't go into all of the what-if scenarios. Um, so that's basically what's going on, is we have a physical response to breath and we have a, a, a mental or a psychological shift that also allows our physiological self to calm down. Are there, is there a little dialogue we can get into with ourselves as well around in those moments? If your brain, the mean voices in your head are predicting a particular outcome, mm. how do you engage that? Well, then we get into the basics of uh, a theory of psychology called cognitive behavioral therapy. And we can look at our thoughts. There's a couple of things. First of all, we can um, distance ourselves from those thoughts a little bit and say, oh, look at that, I'm having a thought. Or even more fundamentally, oh, look at that, I'm experiencing anxiety right now. That's a little bit different than saying, holy crap, I'm scared to death, or oh my God, the world's gonna end. Oh, I'm having anxiety. What's the anxiety about? I'm having this thought about the future. Here's this bad thing that I believe is going to happen. And then you can ask yourself, can I know for certain that that is true? And it turns out that we're actually not very good at predicting the future. And most of the time, that thing we cannot say for certain is true. The only thing that we can say for certain is true is what is happening to us right here, right now, in real time. And most of the time, we're okay. If we bring our consciousness, our awareness back to right here, right now, as opposed to trying to predict the future. I think that's an important point because there's a lot of, there are a lot of articles posts on social media where people will say blanket statements yeah. like this is it this is the end of humanity yes. or our economy is going to tank and it's never going to get better again or anything that they you know the election whatever it is and uh, I think it's because we don't have information so we want to just make a solid prediction or in a way that's a protective mechanism mm -hmm. Uh, if I if I predict the worst case scenario, then I won't be disappointed or, or, or freaked out as much when it happens. Right. I'm sort of inoculating myself to the fear. 
You can do an interesting sort of self-survey, uh, if you like. When you're reading the news or watching the news on TV, notice how many stories you read are about predicting the future and what might happen, often stated as, as you say, a certainty this is what's going to happen, versus the number of stories are about what actually is happening or what has happened that they're reporting on. I don't know the numbers, but I'm guessing like 60% of what we're seeing out there are dire predictions. That might help also uh, titrate the news a little mm -hmm. bit because we do need information, we do want to know what's going on. But making that distinction between the descriptive and the predictive yeah. lets us decide what we're going to read. And it might be easier to say, okay, the governor's doing a press conference, and so that's going to be exactly what's happening right now, yeah. as opposed to some kind of think piece yeah. about here's where we're headed. Yeah, yeah, we want to be really mindful of our media consumption in general. Um, it can be really easy to sit there and scroll through our social media or keep bopping back and forth between whatever news sources uh, we prefer. Um, hoping for perhaps a piece of good news or hoping for the latest update on how to take good care of ourselves and being informed is important sure and there's only so much information that's out there at any given time and only so much that we can really absorb and so maybe check in once twice three times a day max for a few minutes just to get the update but um if if you if you swim in those waters uh it can get uh, pretty overwhelming pretty quickly. And I want to go back to the whole thing too about anxiety and its relationship actually to the immune system. Yeah. Because that's one of the things that we're mm. trying to do is keep ourselves healthy. Yeah. And there, anxiety can actually be disruptive to our ability to do that. Yeah. For all of the immunity boosting ideas that are out there these days, and, and it's good that we're thinking about keeping our uh, immune system strong. Um, the biggest ones have to do with getting enough rest and decreasing your stress levels. Uh, decreasing your stress levels take, takes many forms. The breath work that I talked about, the cognitive work that I talked about, um, practicing gratitude for what is as opposed to focusing on all of the things that we are deprived of right now. Um, focusing on compassion for self and others. Uh, focusing on things that we can control versus things we can't control. Um, and just to make that clear, there's only one thing we can really control, and that's our own behavior. We can wish all we want that things were different or that other people would be changing their behavior, and when we focus on how we wish other people would be behaving, up goes our anxiety, up goes our stress, and it can suppress our immune system. So focusing on things in the here and now and what we can do or what we are doing um, all help to keep us mentally and physically healthy. Let's talk a moment about the difference between pain and suffering. <laughs> because there's a lot of both right yes. now. Yes. And I think part of the challenge is the feeling like looking at the federal administration saying they're doing it about as wrong as they possibly could. It shouldn't be this way. Right. Or you know, these uh, certain choices which people have made, like these people are at the store and they're not standing six feet apart or they're going out for walks together, whatever it might be. And you, it's very easy to get cranked up about that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, not all that useful because we don't have a lot of control over it. Right. Um, but if you could sort of go even farther down that path. Yeah, well, I'll start with just what you said. When we get cranked up about how we wish things were and how we wish people were behaving, really good question to ask ourselves is, does that help? Does it help us getting pissed at the government or other people? Generally, the answer is no, unless we're actually planning on doing something about it and being isolated, probably won't. Um, the difference between pain and suffering, uh, so this is a Buddhist concept and the bumper sticker says, pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. And what that means is the pain we, we can talk about pain as the feelings we have, the feelings of fear, the feelings of sadness, the feelings of anger, the feelings of overwhelm. Um, the suffering is the story we tell about those feelings. So it can go, it, it can be anything from I'm feeling anxious is the feeling and the story is I shouldn't feel this way or it's wrong to feel this way. Or the story can be 
uh, um, this is everything's going to hell everything's going um, to be terrible forever there's no way out of this those are all fictions those are all imaginary scenarios that our brain is cooking up your brain will lie to you <laughs> your brain makes up stuff on a regular basis you have to distinguish between what is real which is the here and now and the stories you're telling about what might be so the other thing i think that people could be struggling with is the fact that this is such there's so much to do and yet so little we can do mm -hmm. simultaneously yeah. and if you're someone who cares about the fate of the world who likes to be of use and certainly taking action being of use can make you feel better mm -hmm. um there might i can imagine getting into a mindset of i'm not doing enough yeah. to help this problem yeah and uh if i were the perfect crisis responder i would be doing x y or z if i were the best if i'd been meditating for the last 15 <laughs> years at on a daily basis i would be less anxious right now um how do we engage those those kind of stories that we're telling ourselves we're all doing our best um and immediately our judgment brain pops up and says no we're not if i was doing my best i'd be doing this and this and this and this, and this. well if you were capable of doing all of those things you'd probably be doing them and by capable i don't mean just physically capable i mean emotionally and we all have our limits and we all have what we are comfortable with what we have the energy for and remember our energy is possibly being pulled in a lot of different directions if we've got kids um, if we've got other people out in the world that we're thinking about, if we're trying to figure out our financial situation, if we're trying to keep our job going. And so there just might not be that much mental or physical or emotional energy that we have to put towards everything. So put it towards what you can. And, you know, as with um, any kind of social activism, there are going to be some people who are called to be on the front line with picket signs and marching and getting arrested and there are going to be other people that are called to uh, write letters to the editor and create podcasts and then there are going to be some people that are called to stay home and create as calm an environment for themselves and anyone they come into contact with um, and that's just as important we um, all have a role to play we all have a role to play and we can't know what's enough enough is a completely arbitrary distinction um, so trust yourself last question on a technical perspective so you and many other health professionals have moved into the world of telemedicine yeah. and I can imagine a lot of people are going to need mental health counseling right now because it's a it's a lot it's a lot to contend with but so much of that experience is about being in the room with your counselor mm -hmm. and the or whoever your healthcare professional is and this is going to be true for you know talking to your your regular primary care physician as well i'm sure um, what's been your experience so far of using telemedicine and and can people trust it as a, another modality uh, so first of all there's a lot of research out there now that suggests that telemedicine is just as effective even in the mental health realm as face-to-face uh, -face. it takes a little getting used to um, you know it's it's set up like any video chat uh, situation um, many therapists have their own uh, HIPAA compliant uh, platforms and ideally you find yourself a private space where you can sit undisturbed and uh, the therapist is usually either at their home or in their office and they've got a private space so you're going to be uninterrupted and you can have a, a conversation just like you would in the office and after a while the artifice and the distance of the video platform starts to fall away and it can feel just as intimate and just as connected um, as you would if you were in their office a um, couple of things that are happening insurance uh, is paying for this um, as far as we know all insurances are if you don't have video uh, telephone is also possible um, if you don't have insurance uh, most uh, mental health care providers that I know are offering deeply discounted rates um, usually a therapy session is an hour long or 50 minutes 55 minutes um, 
most of us offer uh, down to half an hour. We can still um, get reimbursed by insurance for half an hour sessions. If you want just 15 minutes, you can work something like that out. Um, but it is, there can be this idea that, uh, you know, therapy should take a back seat. I've got more important things to worry about. Well, yes, but you're not going to be able to continue to be as effective if your mental health is suffering. And to have somebody out there who you can listen, who will listen to you, who you can unload on, who you can ex express all of your stressors without taking any responsibility for that other person, without giving them another turn, you don't have to care what your therapist is going through during that half hour or 45 minutes or whatever it is. It can all be about you, and given how many people are focused on taking care of others, uh, taking care of yourself is a really good idea. So if people have questions, can yeah. they contact you? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, you can shoot me an email at marknashvt uh, at gmail.com. You can check out my website. I'm on Psychology Today, Mark Nash. If you want to set up an appointment and do it officially, um, but I'm also just ask, uh, answering questions. Um, I'm on Facebook too, uh, Mark Nash in Vermont. Um, yeah, I'm I'm just sharing what I got with everybody. Yeah. Okay. So, um, take good care of yourself. Uh, Hetty Vermont is going to keep trying to provide as much updated information as we possibly can. Um, we are here for you, and Mark is here for you, and uh, we hope you take really good care of yourselves and have the best Monday you possibly can in a pandemic. All right, talk to you later.